Hello my fellow Carbonauts and welcome to the next episode of Realism. I can't remember which number this is so I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, I finally got all the mods set up again. Remote tech seems to be working fine because this episode is when we're going to get it running basically. Um, so this is the rocket we've built. It's not amazing but it works. Um, and yeah, this is basically a rocket. We have to use a Kerbal because we need a uh, control on the rocket that uh, is the right diameter to, for this to all work. Um, so we've got uh, a manned spacecraft for pretty much no reason apart from that. Um, you know, just to make sure, because obviously if we had an unmanned one, then we don't have anything for it to connect to all the time and that would just be a pain. So we've got to take it up in a manned craft. And uh, yeah, it's a bit wobbly. Um, but there's a, we've got three space probes here which we're going to take up into hopefully geosynchronous orbit and uh, that should have us a little network we can work with. They've each got three satellites on them, so obviously, oh, sorry, three, um, three dishes on them and that means that obviously they'll be able to connect to each other and then one will be connected to Kerbin and the other two will have open dishes to use for other communications, you know. So we'll see how that goes. Um, that should be good though, if we can get that all set up. So now, um, yeah, we're just launching up into that orbit. And uh, I was live streaming this actually today. So if you're wondering why there's no sound, it's because I was playing music in the live stream and uh, the music recorded on the game. And I don't think you really want to listen to the music. So I'm just doing it without the sound at the moment. So sorry about that. That's something I'll have to try and find a workaround for, but there's not much I can do about it now. But yeah, you can see it was having a bit of trouble staying stable with the mainsail running because the mainsail has quite a lot of thrust, <laughs> it was wobbling about a lot. But we couldn't really strut it because there was nothing to strut it to. And it didn't really have that much of an effect. All it meant was that the orbit wasn't of the perfect inclination. That doesn't really make too much difference. So, you know, it's, it's still reasonably good, it's still good enough. And yeah, we're not going to worry about it. Uh, so this, this episode, we don't really get any science, it's not really about getting science, but it's more about just getting these things into the orbit that we need to get them to. And uh, at the moment, literally all I'm trying to do is get into a sort of near geosynchronous orbit, maybe a little bit below geosynchronous orbit, so that I can then just launch the um, launch the space probes. So, you know, launch them um, one at a time, basically. And this thing, this current ship, I'm going to leave in a not quite circular orbit so that I can spread the space probes out basically. Uh, so that's how I decided to do that. Or actually no, maybe I do leave this in a circular orbit. I uh, can't quite remember actually, I think I might, yeah I do actually. Um, and then I just use the, because we actually do have an okay amount of fuel in the probes themselves so it's not too difficult to make adjustments to the orbit like that. And we've got an Oscar B fuel tank and then one of the smaller engines. I can't remember what it's actually called. One of the small Rocker Max engines. Which does a pretty good job at this kind of thing. It's more than powerful enough than what we need, but it can also be, um, you know, if you use the throttle reduction, you can actually get quite accurate, um, you know, quite accurate orbits, basically, in, in general. So there we go, we're splitting off the first of the probes after well, actually, this doesn't work, and I'll tell you why. Basically, we don't have any control over it because we can't tag. I, th I forgot that you couldn't target it after you've set it free, so we just quick load there. Pretend it didn't happen, and you actually have to set all the targets up before we before we split away. So we turn on that and decouple it again. And does it work now? I can't remember. Oh no, it doesn't work because we still need to activate the thing. Oh no, it, oh no, it, it's activated, sorry, that's just, it's just that we're not in an orbit which is somewhere on the right side of Kerbin, basically. So we need to time warp quite a lot, and there we go, finally we get a link, which means that we're set up, ready to go with this probe. So we're in a nearly geosynchronous orbit now, now all we have to do is fine-tune it. This one is going to be hopefully the one which stays somewhere above KSC, so this one's going to be the one that is most of the time above KSC. And uh, yeah, we're actually just going to try and burn, get the apoapsis up to, I think it's 2,868,400 meters up. 
and that's the height, that's the altitude of a geosynchronous orbit if you've got it circular. So we're going to get it to about that and then what we're going to do is try and make the orbital period, the time it takes to go around one orbit, six hours because that's the same amount of time that it takes for Kerbin to spin around once. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, well, we're setting up the apoapsis first and then we're going to set the periapsis up just depending on the time basically because the time is more important than the actual altitudes because if one of the altitudes is slightly off you can still use the time to try and get it perfect. So then all we have to do to check it is to go right to the periapsis and then make sure that the apoapsis is exactly three hours away and that means that we're okay. Or just go like a second past the periapsis and make sure it's you know five hours 59 minutes and one set and whatever amount of seconds yeah like that. So that's one way we can do it and now we just have to switch back to the other probes and do them. Now quite a lot of satellites in real life are in uh, geosynchronous orbit and uh, one of the ways that they actually keep them there because obviously they get influenced by the moon things like that they can actually calculate orbits which are kept in the same place the same orbit same place above the earth not Kerbin I was about to say they can actually use the moon's pull along with some onboard propulsion but they don't try they try not to use too much of that because it's sort of inefficient um, you know they they actually manage to keep things in a geostationary orbit using the pull from the moon and it's very very clever um, I, yeah it's mind-boggling almost how they do it it's one of the things they do and uh, yeah you can see now basically I'm actually reducing my orbit so that I can come back and be in the right place be about a third of an orbit away from the other probe so that's what I was doing there and now it's just time to burn prograde and I think yeah I think we're pretty much a third away so um, I can just try and get this apoapsis up to the 2868400 and then we're pretty good to go and again this is a pretty boring and repetitive process so it's not really much I can say about it but I would like to say that um, <laughs> When I was live streaming this, I actually before was planning on live streaming the Realism Overhaul mod pack, but it was just, it's one of those things where it sounds like a really good idea, and then you actually try and do it, and it just doesn't work. <sighs> Yawn. And, uh, yeah, I don't even know why, to be honest. It's al it's always seems to be like that. Whenever I try it, um... I get the motivation to try and install all the mods again and it just doesn't work at the end for some reason and yeah I've managed to have it working before I did actually have it working completely stock but then I tried to add like remote tech and things and it just didn't work it wasn't that it was crashing on loading yeah although it did do that but I fixed it with the texture reduction thing uh, the texture management mod or so it's something like that it's called which basically compresses the text just whenever the game starts up and uses that to um, oh what would you say it uses the texture com you know it uses that to reduce the RAM usage basically to make sure the game doesn't crash because Kerbal Space Program is a 32-bit program at the moment that is probably subject to change hopefully subject to change and uh, that basically means that it can only use three or four gigabytes of RAM and when you've got you know, loads of extra textures and stuff in the game. Um, you know, it it can it can fill up that amount of memory fairly easily. I mean, you're talking about people who have three gigabyte graphics buffers or two gigabyte graphics buffers. That's just the graphics, and that can take up three gigabytes. And the graphics has to be loaded into the RAM as well, so that it can then be loaded into the video RAM when it's needed. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. Basically, you can't have too many mods installed with high resolution textures or you know pictures, otherwise then the game will run out of memory or RAM in your computer. It will be using too much of it for a 32-bit program. And 32-bit programs are all, uh, as a general rule, limited by limited to around three or four gigabytes of RAM. That's why. 64-bit programs or 64-bit operating systems are such a good thing because they allow you to use more than that um, which for some things is very very useful I may as well just talk about computers now because it's something that I know a reasonable amount about 
Um, but yeah, on the topic of like RAM and that kind of thing, one of the things that's actually really beneficial to have lots of RAM for is video editing, because you can actually use it to sort of preload the video into as you're, re as you're um, sort of making it, if that makes sense, as you're editing it. Um, because you need that really fast memory for that to work. Otherwise you need to render it normally, like slowly. So that's one of the things that's really useful. But anyway, we're nearly at that uh, at the place we need to be now. In fact, I think that might be the orbit set up. All we really need to do is connect everything, which isn't very difficult to do, really. Yeah, we're just finishing off circularizing the last orbit. Uh, 2865, I think it is, and then we just make the fine adjustment by reducing the thrust the throttle limiter, something like that. Reducing that so that we get a more fine control. And I think it's 109.1 meters a second is geostationary orbit. Uh, yep, that looks about right. So as long as you're around 109, then you're going to be good but if you want because obviously if you're you know 0 0.1 of 0.1 meters a second out then over a long 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 time you'll eventually drift out drift out of sync with the other satellites so that's something you need to be wary of when you're making these things the more accurate you make them now the longer they'll stay in geosynchronous orbit anyway that's us pretty much done though and um, all that's really left to do is bring the craft down to Kerbin and you can see here this is actually what the orbit of the satellites looks like when they're done. So apart from that, it was fairly uneventful. And uh, yeah, as always, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and have a nice day.